And welcome to the Dr. Tech Show, where myself, Pauline Roach, and Swain Hunter, and occasional guests, guide you to the world of online communications in the show, which is the brainchild of the late great internet evangelist, John Popham. So welcome to our special guest today, Ahmed Kohli. Ahmed, how are you and how has the weather been this week where you are? Hi, Pauline. Thanks for having me. Um, the weather is quite rainy here in lovely London. I'm in Balham right now looking at a park in Balham Common and uh, I'll show you the tooting, uh, tooting back coming. And it is, it is rainy, but beautiful. Mm -hmm. Good to hear. And Swain, where, tell us where you are and how's the weather been? I'm in Orkney as usual and the weather is fair. It's okay. <laughs> fair for Orkney. Yeah. 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 Uh, and here in Birmingham, it has been um, lovely on Saturday, I think, <clears throat> and not so lovely on Sunday. Um, and today it's kind of dull, but hope, I'm hoping to get out for a walk later on. Um, good to keep exercised in these times. Um, so before we um, start to talk to Amit, we'll just go through a few um, things that we're aware of are happening around this time. And one of the uh, a very, very recent, very new uh, national celebration in the US is uh, Juneteenth, uh, the 19th of June, um, officially Juneteenth National Independence Day, historically known as Jubilee Day, Black Independence Day and Emancipation Day. Um, and it's a federal holiday in the US celebrating the emancipation of African American slaves. Originating in Galveston, Texas in 1866, it has been celebrated annually on June 19th throughout the United States, and it became a recognized federal holiday just recently in June 2021, when President Joe Biden signed the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act into law. It's commemorated on the anniversary date of the June 19th, 1865 announcement of General Order No. 3 by Union Army General Gordon Granger, proclaiming freedom for slaves in Texas. Now, this was several months, I think, after freedom had been declared elsewhere. So um, good, but maybe not great. And it's important to um, also mention that um, there's been some pushback um, on this. And um, we acknowledge um, a piece by Kelly Carter Jackson, who was the Assistant Professor of Africana Studies at Wellesley College and the author of Force and Freedom, Black Abolitionists and the Politics of Violence, who says, people can use Juneteenth as a day to move forward new futures by registering voters, getting more folks vaccinated, are pushing elected officials to carry out the work of reparations. If Americans fight to make sure history and critical thinking are integral parts of the classroom experience, students can use that knowledge to change the trajectory of society. Thus, critical race theory does not create division. It engenders solidarity by recognizing our common humanity and compelling Americans to a lot of resources so that everyone might obtain liberty. So I think we, um, given that this show is, you know, wants to encourage people to communicate and, and uh, get on better, especially online. Um, it's good to reflect those, um, those views. Um, around this time, Monday 21st of June is also the equinox, uh, summer solstice, uh, which marks the summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere and the winter solstice in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, the day of the year with the most day hours of daylight in the Northern Hemisphere and the fewest hours of daylight in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and it's funny, even in, in Ireland on, on the West uh, Coast where my mum lives, um, it's been brought right up to 11 o'clock at night, um, so Ireland tends to be an hour behind, ahead. Anyway, mm, uh, an hour more of, of light. You've got lots of light in, in Orkney as well, Swain, have you? Yes, we're just at that, we're at 59 degrees north, so we're just at that point where uh, at this time of year it doesn't properly get dark. I mean, the sun does set in the kind of far northwest, um, but it then rises almost immediately in the far northeast so uh, mm. it's going to dips dips mm -hmm. beneath the horizon i'm sure obviously you... have simmered in better than we do so uh, just, that's good for them i wonder if sales of eye masks go well in in orkney certainly I heavy curtains need one. yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay and two other things um or sorry a couple of other things we've picked up along the way in the last week um on the 23rd of june uh, in 1974 uh, the first extraterrestrial message was sent from Earth into space. And on the 27th of June in 1929, the first colour TV was demonstrated, performed by Bell Laboratories in New York City. I misread that first one. Uh, oh, yeah? To read that the first extraterrestrial message had been received from outer space. <laughs> well, I missed that. <laughs> you know, I think we would have... No, we would have, the first, uh, first we intentional yeah. signal out to those out there. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if they got a response, but um, we, I'm sure we'll hear about it in due course. <clears throat> um, and uh, National Writing Day uh, is due to take place on the 23rd of June, 2021. 
an annual celebration of the power of writing creatively, inspiring people of all ages and abilities to try writing for fun and self-expression. Um, and for National Writing Day 2020, the Literacy Trust uh, UK published new research which showed that lockdown had inspired a resurgence in children and young people's creative writing, which had in turn played an important role in supporting their well-being during this time of uncertainty. And for 2021, they're going to be drawing on their latest research to find out the longer term impact of this change with new findings to be published on the 23rd. So we welcome that. Um, as John Popham, who founded this show, was very keen on storytelling, I'm sure he would have um, been very keen on, on write, writing stories as well. And a couple of events we picked up. Um, this one, the first one is um, from the Australia. And the time of it is going to be it's 10 a.m. AAST, which is 1 a.m. British Standard Time, so that's not great, but some late, some kind of night owls might want to pick it up. It's a, a, a webinar on the Human Rights and Technology Final Report on Accessible Technology for People with Disability, which will focus on the accessibility of goods, services and facilities that use digital communications technology for people with disabilities, with a special focus on accessible broadcasting services and on online platforms. And disability rights experts will discuss human rights and technology final report recommendations that promote more equal access to the benefits of new technology for people with disability. And the panelists uh, are Edward Santo, Human Rights Commissioner, Dr. Ben Gauntlet, Disability Discrimination Commissioner, Rosemary K.S., Chair of the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and Emma Benison, the CEO of Blind Citizens Australia. So, I mean, that will be of more interest to people in Australia, but we know that people listening to this show like to pick up other things that have gone on around the world um, around communication. So um, I recommend that one. And the final event before we come to our special guest is um, uh, one called Tackling the Digital Divide on Friday, 25th of June, a conversation um, organized by Sandwell CVO and Dudley CVS in the, in the West Midlands. They're jointly holding, hosting an informal conversation around the digital divide that exists within the communities. Um, and it's from 10 till 12 on Zoom building on a previous session held in March, and it seeks to bring together individuals and organizations from across Sandwell and Dudley boroughs to have an open and honest conversation about different digital concerns that have arisen primarily as a consequence of COVID-19. And participants are going to be encouraged to ask questions, share experiences, and any digital information or resources, problem solve and connect with digital providers offering support and guidance. So it is, it is mainly aimed at um, anyone in Sandra or Dudley Borough who's interested in sharing their exp experience or expertise or feedback, um, interested in learning more about what other organizations are doing, would like to problem solve and have and or have experience of delivering digital or virtual activities within their community. But I know from attending the March event that um, people from outside Sandra and Dudley are also welcome. Um, and, and it's all part of a conversation I think that we're all having, so it's um, good to encourage more people. So for those of us who are not in the West Midlands, Sandwell and Dudley are two boroughs in the West Midlands, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. yeah. Yes. With yes. Very active um, Council for Voluntary Service, um, and so I highly recommend, uh, you know, tuning into that if you can. And so we come to our very special guest today, Amit Kohli. Amit and I met through um, a Slack group um, called Tech Tech for Good Mavens and Mavericks, run by Nissa Ramsey, who used to work for Comic Relief. Um, and Amit is an environmental engineer turned data specialist. Amit started his career collecting and using environmental data to clean soil and water resources, and then disseminated water resources and uses data with UNFAO's Aquastat, and then worked as data director as a large international NGO, and is now a freelance data consultant and trainer. He's passionate about data skills for all, and has led data user groups in two countries. He's the author of several data science libraries, and we have links to his blog, um, which we can put out um, at the end of the show as well. So Amit, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. Um, please tell us a bit about your, we like, we like to hear about our, our visitors, our guests, early career in digital and data. We'd love, we'd love to hear about yours. Let's see. <clears throat> so when I started off as an environmental engineer, I think the first steps that I took into data um, were more um, due to the kind of laziness slash hard working combination that I have which is kind of difficult to, um, to explain, but I, because I'm so impatient and I am so hardworking, I find the laziest way to do things. Um, and that just very early on in my career that resulted in me saying, I could not possibly format one more Excel table. Um, if I do that, then I'm just, I'm just going to lose my mind. 
Um, so you start learning about Excel macros and you start exploring ways of just being faster and just learning tricks like in Excel, try to not touch your mouse um, ever to just navigate everywhere, just using the control shift and the arrow keys and things like this. And then, you know, that kind of permeates into, well, what else can I do? And then you start becoming really um, quick with using Alt tab to switch between windows on your desktop. Um, and then just this just mentality just snowballs into more or less a kind of addiction slash self-competition to say, how quick can I get these tasks done? Uh, which is a great way of thinking about mundane tasks, by the way. Mm. Um, yeah. And then, so that was just early on. I just drank the Kool-Aid in terms of uh, efficiency and um, investing an hour to try to save 15 minutes, you know, basically for the rest of your life. Multiple um, 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And then actually there's this, uh, there's this resource. I'll try to find it. Uh, there's this XK, XKCD comic mm -hmm. for which he actually worked out uh, the time allotments to figure out how much time can you spend at the beginning of a task if it's going to save you one second, five minutes, 10 minutes, and then how often. So basically it works out to a matrix where, you know, it makes sense that you can spend a week on a task if it's going to save you one second, more than 20 times a day. <laughs> so you work this whole thing out. Um, I think I found it. Yeah, that's the one. Ah, right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. That's worth a bit of study later. Uh, yeah, for, so for, for, for our, yeah, hope later yeah. listeners, what do we say, uh, Swain? Oh, um, I used to do, um, oh, never mind. It's a table. It's a complicated table, which is at um, xkcd.com slash 1205. And it's exactly what Amit just said it was. <laughs> yeah, the, of course, the problem, um, he has another problem um, in which he delves into the details of this. Um, friends of mine and me, we would gladly prefer to optimize a solution rather than actually work on the problem itself. And then you find yourself in a situation where you're, you're spending all your time optimizing the solution. Oh, yes. And, oh, yeah. uh, and then, and then basically, you know, you don't have any time to do the task. I thought anymore. it was just me, Amit. I thought it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> He's got another chart explaining that one. Mm. Uh, but yeah, basically, um, no, no, but I think it is important. I think it is important, especially because, you know, if, if you are somebody who has some leadership capacity, um, especially within the uh, data for good sector or, or anybody doing anything for good, I do believe that um, there is a axis of technical thinking that is frequently kind of seen as the uh, counterpoint to being more of a humanist kind of a thing. Um, and that's kind of the divide that you tend to find in most kind of NGO charity kind of sectors to say, are you more of a human person or are you more of a uh, technical person, which I, I see as a false equivalence um, but, but without going down that route too much, I do think that there is a third axis, which is actual data maturity, data savviness, uh, the ability to handle information, which is different than technical skills. Because I might be, my technical skill might be, I know how to design a survey. I know how to accurately and uh, statistically evaluate the best strategy, the best way to move these things forward. But if I don't have the tools, if I don't have the data savviness to move these things forward, then I do think that somebody like me, who's this kind of optimization addict, um, there's things that I've discovered in my career that within five minutes, I can, I, well, I can teach somebody in an hour, a five minute thing that will save them weeks of work. Um, you know, I, I, you know, they say charity starts at home. And uh, my father is a researcher working in, in South America on wheat, trying to improve wheat, um, uh, find a way of making it better, getting better technologies, et cetera. And one of the things that he had a problem with, the way that the research would come in, he would have to manually insert rows into Excel, depending on how many breeding experiments were done for each specific crop. And that's obviously variable. It depends on the conditions that you see in the field. Um, so there was no way for him to prepare this or to somehow systemize this. So he would get an Excel spreadsheet and it would take either him or someone in his staff, um, like literally, you know, eight to maybe 16 hours 
just inserting a variable number of rows and then creating the pedigree lines underneath. So to say this is, you know, breed AB17-1, AB17-2, and then AB18-1 through nine. So this is all manual effort. So first of all, error prone. Second of all, boring. <laughs> boring. Yes. Very. So we talk about how horrible this is to spend 18 hours, maybe 20 hours, maybe <laughs> doing this. And you're going to certainly screw it up, right? Because the brain can't stay engaged for that long. So here I come. It, it took me, it must have taken me 30 minutes to write a visual basic macro for him. Um, and, and so something so small like that had such a meaningful impact in terms of just job satisfaction of, of somebody. And it's, and it's forever, right? Mm. Um, so I do think that there is a, I think there is a place for just talking about um, what is the absolute most efficient way that we can do this, even if it doesn't serve you in the short term, I think it creates a skill set that is um, that generates value for a lot of these people that have this kind of low uh, data data manipulation maturity. Um, you know, you can push them forward by weeks, months. You can show them that things are possible that they didn't think was possible. I think that's great, and it's exactly the sort of thing that I have tried to encourage, especially with small charities who don't have the people or the skills or the time really to waste um, doing things that, like you said, you know, could take weeks um, when something simple, uh, you know, a fix could could really benefit them. Um, and that's, that's why I'm active in the tech for good world, because um, people, there are people like us out there. I don't have those skills, but I have other skills um, who can help move things forward and as I say especially in small charities because the 97 percent of the charity world in the UK um they you know they're they're under a million pounds income every uh, a year and a lot of them a lot less than that and they're doing great work on the front lines think how much more efficient they could be if they could incorporate some of these these fixes so you you worked for an NGO yourself Ahmed can you yeah. say a bit more about that yeah, so the NGO that I worked for, uh, it was a large international NGO called ACDI Voca. They mostly work with uh, poor farmers, although not really. Um, they work with um, basically different communities in need in Colombia. They worked on, uh, we had an inclusion project trying to increase uh, the job opportunities for um, women, Black people, and homosexuals, transsexuals, all of these minority groups that are underrepresented or unfortunately underemployed because of cultural things. We worked on changing cultural bias. Uh, we worked on reconciliation efforts after the guerrilla fighters stepped down in Colombia. Um, then again, you know, we have livestock projects in Bangladesh or um, yeah, like a forestry project in Liberia, you know, basically all across. But what they did particularly well, I think was they genuinely tried to implement what we call sustainable change by value chain alineation. So that's don't not, it's kind of the opposite um, frame of mind of just giving money to uh, un the underprivileged and then kind of hoping for the best or hoping that they kind of self-organize. Uh, what you do is you work with a middle sector in economy and you develop their appetite for working with the poorest of the poor, which, you know, there's no, there's no, global conspiracy. Well, there are some global conspiracies, but <laughs> there's no global conspiracy to not work with poor people. The reason why no one works with poor people is because it doesn't make sense on a scale, right? Why am I going to talk to a thousand people to get one ton of material when I can speak to 10 people and gather a hundred thousand tons? Mm -hmm. um, but there are people, that doesn't mean that there's no economic value in working with those people. So that's the thing. If we can work with a bank, we can get them better loans at a lower rate, so if we train a bank to understand risk of working with small, small, small holders better, then if you know a bank, a bank protects itself. So if I don't understand the risk, I'm gonna say, fine, I'll give you money, but I'm gonna hit you with a really high interest rate to protect myself because I don't know if you're gonna pay me back or not. But as soon as we educate them to say, this is what a good proposal is, this is what a bad proposal is, now all of a sudden that risk rate can come down, especially if for the short term, somebody can come step in and say, any losses that you have, any defaults that you have, we're gonna cover out of this gigantic pool of money that will disappear in five years. So there's basically no, no risk to you. 
just to try, try it out for a period of five years. Um, over the course of five years, you know, they scale up, they understand. Now all of a sudden other banks say, hey, there's this pool of money that we didn't know existed, you know? So now all of a sudden there's this competition, all of these kind of economic principles can come in and others people that are interested in reaching out to a new village and saying, who would like a loan here? And at the same time, we work with those poor farmers saying, even if you don't have, um, even if you're not literate, we can even if you're not if you don't have a good numeracy skills, then we work on that. Even if you're illiterate, though, we can teach you to talk about assets and liabilities, right? We can. We, how much land do you have? What are your plans? What is your plan next year? It's things that they they know all of this. They just don't know how to say it in a way that is what we call a business plan, right? That's what people say. I do. Do you have a business plan? I'm like, I don't know. Ooh. Yeah, it's like, I, I, of course, I don't have a business plan. That sounds like something the lawyer has to come up with. Like, of course not. You and your family have been surviving off of these crops. You've been selling crops for 100 years, 200 years, you know, for generations. This is knowledge that you have. We just teach you how to say it in this kind of a way. And now all of a sudden, um, that creates a potentially sustainable change because now the bank has an appetite and people believe that they do have access to resources. So now all of a sudden, it's something that we can say, okay, cool. I see the value of renting a tractor in this co-op, in this community. I see the value of going to farmer, farmer schools. You know, so that all of a sudden, when we deal with a short-term risk, when the organization steps out, at least there's a chance that business processes will continue to work. Why? Because everybody makes money. Mm. And if everybody makes money, then the, then the change is sustainable. If you say, please go out and help this community because they really need it, that's going to fail, right? So I think that's one of the things that this organization did particularly well. Um, I really liked their bit kind of the change that they were trying to bring into the world. I really liked it. And um, yeah, as the, um, I started off as the um, regional systems and technology director. I was stationed in Ghana, mm. um, mostly developing databases. But as my, um, as my job scope kind of progressed, I ended up um, working as the data director in that organization and more or less handling um, everything, everything data related that's not finance data because um, that was under the CFO's kind of uh, mandate. So they had their own system for financial information, but every, all of the other information in terms of monitoring and evaluation, impact assessment, and then any needs that anybody else had in terms of tracking volunteers in and out of the country, security risks of working in different countries, um, the security status in terms to understand how much people should be paid to move there, um, all, of the, all, all of that information that all more or less came under my purview. So yeah, playing with information coming in, coming out, building manual uh, data warehouses. Mm. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, sounds like it. And you uh, did some work for the UN as well. Yeah, at the United Nations, I worked for this um, program called Aquastat for seven years. And um, it's really funny, you know, um, they say that, say always or never, and God laughs his ass off. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say that, but I swore that I would never work in agriculture because my father is a kind of a big name in agriculture. And I, you know, being a Mexican person, I didn't want anybody to think that daddy found me a job. So I swore that I would never work in agriculture and I dedicated my career to you know, environmental engineering and then water. Um, and it just so happened that the best database on global water resources happened to be in the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United and Nations. It makes sense when you think about it. <laughs> yeah. And there I you mean, are. Things that happen, right? Uh, but uh, s such is life. Um, mm. So yeah, so I ended up uh, going to Going there after my master's degree, I was looking for something a little bit more uh, bigger in scale, bigger in impact. And yeah, just ended up learning a lot about how um, renewable water resource assessments are done. Um, also, how do we gather information on different countries? Um, how do you, how do you, yes, yeah, standardize and or harmonize water resource information and water usage information? So that when someone says, I'm extracting this much from the groundwater table, how do you compare that to somebody that says, this is what my permit says I'm allowed to extract from a river. That's, I mean, it's, it's, it gets really complicated. 
Um, but yeah, that's where you really start learning the value of um, definitions. Mm. And as boring as it sounds, but I started learning that the assessment to evaluate numbers is the, 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 the methodology of the assessment is almost more important than the number itself. Um, this especially sort of coming in, you know, we're working with information from all over the world. So um, if you're working in some uh, developing country, developing uh, between uh, air brackets, mm. it's highly possible that they have formalized water networks in large urban centers, but not in rural communities. So that information doesn't exist. So we, I remember getting information from countries that said the water withdrawal from natural resources for the top three cities was this. What do, what do I do with that information? How do I then make that comparable to, um, you know, information coming from Norway where they know, you know, every last, you know, extraction or some somewhere small, especially um, in which, you know, the entire network is highly controlled, especially if it's a water scarce country, you know, um, like a lot of the, um, the countries in uh, what we call Nina, so Near East and North Africa. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of control on resources there because water is so scarce, of course, you know, every last drop counts. So it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And that's where I really started becoming a little bit more of a data specialist rather than a water specialist, which mm. is what I had been kind of working my way into that water world. I started realizing that the data management itself is um, perhaps something that is a little bit more interesting for me um, and more extrapolatable, right? Yeah, sure. So how is your, how, how have you um, most enjoyed using your skills, getting involved in the, in the community, in the digital and data communities here in the UK? Yeah. I mean, um, I have a, so now that I'm, a, now that I'm a freelancer, I mean, the first thing that I did was um, I, I quit my job during COVID um, because COVID was happening at the very beginning, nobody knew anything, but I immediately, yeah, I mean, you know, as a more or less scientist, I, I, I know what a pandemic means and I know, I know what the R value of over one means. And I was listening to the guidance and I, I, I early on, I knew this is going to be a major problem. So um, yeah, I thought that even though I do believe in the work that ACD Ivoca was doing, I thought that if I worked on something um, slightly more urgent, perhaps I could minimize the loss of life. So I became involved in this community called Coronavirus Tech Handbook, mm, yeah. which was an early attempt to gather all of the information on Corona um, that all countries knew. And it was this kind of crowdsourced thing where there was people from all over the world dumping resources, whether it be data sets or uh, mental health resources or or how to how to recognize even um, uh, that there was that there was uh, gaps in information sources in different mm. countries mm. so we did that for a little while I got involved through that I got involved with um, uh, the new speak house group which is involved in uh, quite a few kind of it's 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 a position the way that I I don't think they would define themselves like this but I I see them positioned between the um, technology and politics and sociology perhaps so yeah so I'm working on um, on a couple of initiatives with them uh, they're still they're still in early phases so I'm not I, I'm not sure I'm so I'm allowed to talk about them but I'm involved in that with them uh, I also am uh, I contribute a lot to data kind mm. um, it is data kind is an organization well data kind UK um, specifically works with charities and if they have any data needs uh, regardless of the maturity level right mm. um, they basically help them along that path and if 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 anyone is listening and if uh, anyone is a charity and they don't know what data maturity is then please contact data kind uk <laughs> yeah because not knowing is perhaps they're, they're very good we've had dulcie we had dulcie on we had dulcie Vosden on um uh, during the start of the Data for Good Festival uh, recently, uh, just to give us a, a brief overview of what was happening. So yeah, and DataKind is a wonderful organization. I would I, I completely agree with you, Ahmed. Um, I've been to some of the- DataKind.org for Radio Hope listeners. 
Yeah, chapter stroke datakind hyphen UK because datakind UK is a char ah, is a yes. charity in its own right. It's a chapter of datakind, um, but it's 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 a charity in its own right. But I, I do recommend their data dives. I've been to a few. I've organised one. Um, I've done some project management for datakind. So yeah, highly recommend them. Um, so have you been to some of their events, Ahmed? Yeah, yeah. I um, I'm a frequent contributor to more or less a, a bunch of their initiatives. Uh, mm. I taught R, the R um, statistical language. Mm -hmm. I taught R to um, a bunch of charities. Uh, yeah, it was like a 12 week course. Um, yeah, and I did that pro bono. I, I, I just, I, well, I love teaching and I love the R language. And, um, and yeah, again, we were talking right about how a small lift for me could potentially yield, you know, really kind of exponential rewards. So mm -hmm. I did that. Um, I'm involved right now in a data core, which is a longer pro program. Yeah. I'm the uh, technical mentor for a program that's uh, working with uh, Stop the Traffic. And um, yeah, basically just trying to understand uh, different news sources. So they have, you know, their data ambassadors, they have a, a highly competent team. And I'm kind of uh, one of the people that sits back and asks questions, uh, which is a very cushy job. <laughs> so you mentioned the R statistical language. Uh, that yeah. What is that and who, who would that be of interest to? Well, um, so you are, I will give you the caveat that you are speaking to an absolute aficionado, maven, crazy person. Uh, I believe very strongly in this tool, um, but I'll give you the kind of unbiased answer first. Okay. R is a statistical language um, that was developed um, about 20 years ago now. Um, I think they just turned 20. And basically what it does is it just creates a language um, which is open source in which allows you to explore different data sets and have different, um, each data set has its own properties. So they would create different methods to analyze them. Uh, but the fact that it was open source meant the community um, could write their own packages and start contributing to that over uh, more and more. And over the course of time, uh, because the language is very open, um, you can force the language to do all kinds of unholy things, uh, which ended up being a, a great strength because it is now so much more than a statistical language. It is, um, it is absolutely a Swiss army knife. Um, if you work with data, it allows you to do basically anything. Let's say you can capture a data set, you can um, and by capture, I mean, for example, either acquire it via, you know, just an Excel table or a CSV file, or you can go out and read um, new, read different websites. So, for example, uh, one of the examples that I give um, when I'm trying to show the how easy it is to do things with R, um, in, in about 20 minutes, I'm able to go to a website that has a list of different bars. In that town, like bars, like pubs, kind of a thing. Um, so I can find that. I can identify what elements are being mentioned. So what actual bar it is. I can capture that. I can run a, a geocoder on that to find the coordinates. I can put that on a map. I can then look up on Bing.com the reviews of this capture all of that information, blend that together, and present that into this kind of colored map that shows the gradations of different bars. And this whole exercise will take about 20 minutes. So I, I think it's quite powerful in that. I, I like this example because I'm creating something new, right? Mm -hmm. We like to think as data mm -hmm. as a rectangle that exists that is given to me by somebody or that I have to spend a lot of time to do, but there's this kind of holy rectangle mentality towards what data is. And the, and the fact of it is that doesn't exist anymore. Anything and everything is data. You can create a data set. Um, some time ago, I created this one exercise also in R, in which, um, yeah, I was kind of angry how you hear only about some diseases over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't hear about some other diseases that are very important for from a healthcare point of view. So what I did was I did this exercise. I went into a, um, I think it was the CDC's website, 
I'm not sure, some, some open source repository. And I downloaded all of the deaths in, uh, per disease in a structured kind of a way. So that was structured data. And then what I did was for each one of those diseases, I put the, those results in Bing. And I basically just captured the number of websites that link to that specific thing mm. as a extremely loose proxy of popularity of disease or how many times it's mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of ran some ground tests to see if it was a reasonable thing and it kind of was. So then I put those things together just to create these networks. And um, yeah, I created these uh, networks of disease families um, in which uh, you can see the darker the each ball is, the more lethal it is, but the bigger it is, the more internet kind of um, real estate it, it occupies. Mm. So it provides this kind of really easy way of saying, hey, here's a really red ball, but that's very, very small. What is this? So now, for example, within the elderly population, tripping and falling is one of the greatest causes of loss of life, mm. which is not something that you hear about. You know, you're, and why? Because it doesn't make news, right? It doesn't make news. Uh, somebody else tripped and fell in the, in the tub. Mm. Very, very relevant, um, but not uh, sexy. It's not news. So this is the kind of things that you can use R to do. You see, it's uh, I'm trying to give you non-statistical applications. Mm -hmm. um, then within the statistics, of course, you know, you can do um, any amount of complexity that you want. People have been hearing about machine learning um, and deep learning, perhaps, or AI, all of these things. So these are all things that are possible to do um, uh, using using the R language. And of course, creation of all kinds of visualizations. So, some, so someone is, if someone realizes they have a, a mountain of data in whatever form and they want to do stuff to it, and they want to use R to do that, where should they go? What should they do to try and learn this stuff? Um, that's a good point. Um, so there are several, uh, there are several uh, tutorial kind of sites. Um, the one thing that I would say is it depends on the user. It depends on the user. If the user has some amount of kind of technical experience, if they feel comfortable basically starting a language from scratch, then I would recommend the book R for Data Science. It's written by Hadley Wickham, mm -hmm. and it is a kind of ex. Oops. I Nobody still need me. No, I think it's Amit's end. Amit's just maybe on a yeah. pause in his yeah. uh, broadband. Oh, yeah. there we go. Oops, oh, sorry. You, we just, lost you. You, you just went a bit still and silent for a second there, Amit. So if you go back to the, the, the author of the book. Uh, yeah, so it's Hadley Wickham. Um, Hadley Wickham. is the author of the book. And it's a good first place to start. Um, it can have a little bit of a steeper slope in terms of learning. Um, but for somebody like that, uh, for somebody that has already some skills um, within the data um, management side of things, the other thing that I would recommend to do is honestly start with a problem statement, start with a problem that you want to solve and Google blogs. Mm. Just look for blogs. Um, I myself, I, I blog uh, pretty well. I used to blog more often uh, than I do now, perhaps now, now that I'm a freelancer, it's a little bit more difficult to do with that much work for myself for free. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically that's the best way. If you have a problem that you want to solve, um, you'll never stop trying to solve that problem. Whereas if you're following a tutorial, it becomes an insurmountable mountain. Oh yeah, off of data science, yeah. I remember that one from, uh, I did data journal, I studied data journalism, um, I made for a year, 2018-19 in Birmingham. And this was a popular book, I, I, on the shelves anyway. <laughs> I'm not sure I ever took it off the shelf, but yeah. No, I mean, it's 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 a really excellent book and Hadley Wickham is um, himself um, more or less kind of a guru of the community. Um, he's developed several tools that are uh, really, really wonderful. Um, but yeah, so in terms of if you if you feel that you don't have that much um, uh, uh, data maturity, if you if you don't feel that you're high on that curve, um, I would recommend following one of these online courses, MOOCs. Mm. They're not excellent uh, for learning. Of course, the best would be to um, sign up to an uh, to a personal course. Find somebody that's offering a course in person if you can if you can afford it. If you can 
find somebody to pay for the course for you. That's of course the best way to learn. Mm. Um, and second, Googled online course R for data, and there's a whole list of stuff there. Yeah, quite enough. So uh, if if that's the way that people want to approach it, then that's that's what you can do. It, sa- if it sounds like people should make some yeah. time to like, get I'm, their I'm, heads around it at some level. Yeah, I, I think R could become my twenty fourth twenty fourth language that I'm that I'm absolutely elementary at and not very good at doing anything with. I think I'll I think I'll have a go at that. <laughs> I recommend it. I highly recommend it. I'm getting no, bored of Python. I... Sorry, go ahead. I'm getting bored of Python. Good, good. <laughs> Python is, of course, the, uh, the 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 other big language in data science. There's, of course, Julia as well, uh, but the big one that is being used by most companies is Python, mm. um, which is absolutely infuriating because I genuinely believe that it's the worst tool for the job for a lot of things. Um, for some things, Python is superior, of course, um, but for most things data related, R is just a much better platform mm-hmm. that lets you solve those problems. So it's infuriating that uh, <laughs> there's so many jobs in Python. But uh... one thing that caught my eye, um, Amit, on your LinkedIn, because we we tend to look at people's LinkedIn as well, is that you offer a under your list of um, services that you offer a session on why CRM systems are a waste of money. Yeah, I'm really fascinated to hear if you can give us the um, overview of that, if you don't mind. Um, uh, how aggressive am I allowed to be on your show? As, as much as you like. Controversial. You can be yeah, a bit we, controversial. We, we, we owe no one anything, so you can do what you can say what you like. It's because <laughs> human beings are stupid. Oh, okay. <laughs> Is the bottom line. No, being being slightly less aggressive. Um, Systems are, um, well, systems always fail. I don't know if you're familiar with this um, kind of paradigm called systematics. I'm not. Uh, there's this book that I highly recommend called The Systems Bible. Um, anybody that's a practitioner in the field uh, needs to read this. It is hilarious. It talks about all of the ways that systems break. Um, how systems kick back and they never do what they're supposed to do. They actually technically don't do what they're supposed to. Um, But basically this talks about all of the ways that things go bad. And one of these principles that comes out of this book is complex systems don't work. They never work. Mm -hmm. If you try to build a complex system, you will fail a hundred percent of the time. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because systems take a life of their own on. So when you try to, create, you know, let's say that I am a relatively competent, well-intentioned manager, and I have a series of problems that I would like to address by just taking one CRM and just one size fits all, solving all of my problems. Um, One of two things is going to happen. Either I take a CRM off the shelf and I just force everybody to use that. And that more or less might work because it's a good way of solving most problems. Uh, Where I perhaps put my foot down is people that think that they're particularly clever and people that think that they have a huge number of user requirements, where now the system also needs to be able to do this and also needs to be able to do this. Um, The problem with those bridges that you're building is that every single one of them is asking the system to do a specific thing. And the more specific you get in terms of asking a system to do anything at at any given point in time, that means that it's not well tested, right? So the more specific you get, the less tested you get. And what ends up happening is you have a system that breaks. So I myself, the way that I approach things, um, I prefer to use more smaller systems that work very well at doing one thing. Mm -hmm. And when I identify a need, that isn't being met by anything, then find either find something else that has already been done or build bridges, you know, kind of by hand. So this is where R comes in very useful as a kind of glue between systems because it allows me to do extremely sophisticated things between systems. But now I can use two systems that are very, very good at doing one thing, Mm. right? So the taking a step back, why don't I uh, think that CRM modification is something that needs to be done? It's because the the second that the system is done, 
you're going to realize one of two things. Number one, you didn't have a good understanding of these system requirements because you didn't ask the right people, right? That's the big one that always happens. The second thing, you're going to realize that you solved a problem that was not the root cause of the problem. You solved a symptom. You didn't solve the main thing, which is people don't like sitting on computers, perhaps. So now you have an extremely expensive system. You have an extremely expensive suit that is ill-fitting and maybe you needed pants. So my point is iterate quickly with systems. Hmm. So, so solve one problem at a time and solve it quickly. And these kind of catch all CRM systems aren't designed that way. They're designed to solve all problems at the same time. Hmm. So that's more or less in a nutshell yeah. why I believe that. That being said, one caveat, if you're a very, very small organizational team and you have no idea how to do anything and you are flexible, mm. then I do believe that CRMs are very good. Mm. Yeah, it's an ongoing issue. I, I'm, I'm in several Facebook groups where what people are constantly talking about what CRM they should get for their for their um, organization and certain certain ones come up um, again and again. And, and it, over time, you know, people prefer one, rather than the other um and uh, and what i like about the newer systems is that the uh, people developing them are responsive to the needs of their of their users and they they you know they're they're sort of in constant development and they do develop things that they're asked to develop you know extra elements so i, I like that I've, I've talked to a few lately um uh, yeah sorry were you going to say something else no i was just going to say the problem then becomes also making sure that there's people in the organization that have ownership and that know how to manage a complex system. Mm. That's the other issue, right? If people yeah. leave and, yeah. you know, that was the one person that knew how to manage a complex system, I think it's you, the, the organizational risk is much lower having multiple small solutions that I can have. I can plug and play multiple people into. Mm. So an ill-fitting solution is better if it's mm. going to be something that's not going to cause a problem in the future. And also, if, if, you're, if your main focus is on connecting together two simple systems to do something more, more um, elaborate, then the effort of doing that will tend to produce more kind of documentation and conversation and shared understanding of what's actually going on. Whereas if, you, if you've, all you've got is one large behemoth system that you put this information into and you get this information out of, then you can quickly end up over, you know, a few years of when people churn, you can quickly end, turn out to have a, a situation where nobody really understands why this information is coming out in the first place. Yeah. So, yeah. Or like think about reporting tools, right? Like all these big things, they have these automated dashboards, right? First of all, they're extremely complicated to use. I have never found a good system. Second of all, they have three chart types, bar charts, pie charts, which by the way, should never be used. It's a waste <laughs> of data ink. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you're lucky, they'll have a scatter plot and they might have a line chart. Mm. Yeah. You know, compare that to Power BI or Tableau, mm. which I can train somebody in one day, I can train them to use Power BI at a competent level. Mm. And now all of a sudden you can create extremely sophisticated looking dashboards. And here's the issue, right? We're talking about trainability. If that person leaves, it's plug and play. You'll find anybody else that'll use Power BI. So why am I ever going to use a, the dashboard functionality of a CRM? ever there's never any use it's it's more complicated to deliver an inferior product yep and there who has the sales budget that's the question <laughs> <laughs> that's another another story um i'll be coming back to you Ahmed, for some of this because i can see i can see um you know uh, applications for for many of the things that i'm involved in but let's um well, uh, as we're kind of in the last 10 minutes or so of the show, we'll, we'll talk about a few of the stories we've come across and feel free to um, add your comments um, as we go through them. Um, so the first one was about the Scottish government adding to their digital inclusion fund. And this was on the UKAuthority.com website. Um, the Scottish government has announced plans to invest £26 million in a new round of projects to reduce digital exclusion in the country. It said that the next stage of the Connecting Scotland programme will support training and skills development for about 23,000 people on low incomes, along with the provision of devices such as iPads and Chromebooks and unlimited data for two years. I think that was the bit um, swaying that caught my eye, the unlimited data for two years, because that's, you know, as we know, often the, um, the thing that stops people from 
being able to completely, you know, completely uh, own and, and use what they what they're being offered. Um, organizations can apply for funding for specific initiatives uh, up to 5th of July. That is the organization in Scotland, obviously. And in addition, an existing 36,000 recipients will receive another year of unlimited data. So this is building on a previous funding aimed at helping more people access the internet, including those who were at high risk from COVID-19, care home residents, disadvantaged friends, families with children and young people living care. So I think that's- As far as I can see, news. this is great news uh, and it's more or less, it's just adding another year to the, to the scheme. The Connecting Scotland project was, was born out of uh, the sudden need in pandemic pandemic times for people both isolated and lonely people and also young people to get devices and data and be able to use them um, and it's been a very successful scheme um, particularly because it's been kind of device agnostic so mm. um, it's not it's not um, focused on iPads or Chromebooks in particular just whatever device is, is best for the particular application and the other really important thing of it is that they have in addition to the funding for the, the devices and for data for those devices, they've also invested in training uh, what they've called a, a set of digital champions mm. to be specifically available to help people get connected. So it's the three elements. It's the, it's the, the, the device, it's the data needed to make the device connect to the internet. It's getting started on becoming skilled in using the device. And the other, the other, the other plank, of course, is, has been um, online security, and there's been a lot of focus on that as well. How to keep safe online um, and not get scammed, basically. Yeah. So yeah, it's great to see that there's another year, another year of that coming in Scotland. I saw a tweet from um, a guest we've had on the show a couple of times previously, and, and recently Simon Finch uh, over the weekend, where people were asking him, "Are there any free online resources about uh, online security?" And his website. He, he shares all of those so if you want don't those look up simon finch and online security and you'll find his website with lots of good free resources there okay the next story is called lessons from befriending in the time of covid 19 and this is from independent age who um uh talk about befriending you know during the pandemic more people than ever relied on the lifeline of a weekly befriending called uh, to cope with loneliness and for those who don't know, befriending is a long-established approach to tackling loneliness involving regular meetings between two people for the purposes of conversation and companionship. And schemes typically match a person who has limited social contact with a volunteer who then contacts them on a regular basis. And unlike um, many other services, befriending is open-ended and matches often only end when one individual moves away from the area or dies. Um, and obviously, uh, during COVID-19, it was one of the few services organizations could provide while group-based activities and services were suspended. And other opportunities were, for social interaction were significantly significantly reduced, and it's been on the front line as well as the last line in tackling loneliness over the last year. Um, and uh, it ha has helped people to deal with loss and anxiety as well as practical issues, alongside its core purpose of providing companionship. Um, and the the report goes on to say there have been significant changes during the pandemic, and most obviously the shift from face to face to telephone befriending, um, and that's obviously enabled befriending to continue. Um, but conversations organizations are saying are typically shorter, often harder to sustain, more demanding on staff and volunteers. And there's been an explosion in demand, obviously, because people, lots of people would want this service. Um, many organizations have doubled the number of matches they're supporting. And nearly half the organizations in the study extended their services to a larger geographic area and have recruited more, many vo more volunteers. Um, the increase in numbers has been accompanied, they say in the report, by a step change in complexity Befrienders are encountering, encountering increased fear, anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues, and alarming levels of suicidal ideation. On top of the immediate impact in terms of bereavement and fear of dying, the pandemic has surfaced past trauma and loss. Um, and I mean, on, on a positive note, the shift to the phone has allowed organizations to reach some people they had not been able to before because their circumstances made home visits challenging, for example, heavy smokers or drinkers, or people with hoarding behaviors. So people have been able to reach people they might not have talked to before. Um, reaching volunteers from a wider area has made it easier to match people who don't speak English as a first language. Um, but on the other hand, organizations have struggled to support people with cognitive or hearing impairments over the phone. Um, and to manage the sudden increase in demand, many organizations streamlined their processes for assessment and matching. Um, lighter touch processes often matching on a first come first serve basis, but matches apparently have worked well. Um, and so the, the plan, um, 
you know, kind of as, as time is wearing on now, they're planning, um, many organizations are planning to move to a blended model of support, offering both phone and face-to-face -face befriending. Um, um, there'll be a long and resource intensive transition period where organizations ensure a safe return to face-to-face -to -face visits while sustaining the telephone offer. So they're make, making some recommendations around befriending, which I think are relevant to, to this program. Um, they're recommending that organizations involved in befriending should carefully plan and manage the transition to a blended model put appropriate mental health support in place for volunteers and staff and build on their inclusion efforts and lessons from this period. And for organizations to fund befriending, they recommend they should resource sufficient levels of staffing and support for volunteers, recognize organizations will be double running for an extended period and fund this transition period accordingly and support the organizations they fund to address common challenges such as transition, mental health and inclusion. Well, I think, you know, befriending is something we're, I'm sure we're all familiar with and uh, something that, um, comes up a lot around the kind of people that we're in contact with and uh, we, you know, if that can be managed better, then um, we're, we're all in favour of that. Very interesting to see a sector um, addressing this, this question of um, blended online or telephone on the one hand and face to face on the other hand. It'll be really interesting, I think, to see how the various sectors of which befriending is one, but there's lots of others events and so on. It'd be really mm. interesting to see how things either move forward into some kind of new ways of working or whether we just slither back into the old if you can't get to a room at a certain time on a certain day you can't take part type attitude yeah yeah i was also well, involved um, early on in the covid um uh, pandemic breakout there was this group called covid tech support.com mm. covid tech support.com and basically they were providing services to any charities that found that the way that they could have helped people had changed and they had no idea they had to scale up really, really quickly. Um, there's groups all around the world kind of trying to do this um, in Argentina. I was involved with a group also called Meta Docencia, so Meta Teaching, in which they were teaching teachers how to do Zoom stuff, you know, um, mm -hmm. which is a skill that they've never had to do. So I, th I think yeah. I think this is really an appropriate and important thing of saying, how are we going to continue to work in the social good sector? And that was, you know, again, back to the, the reason for establishment of, of this show, because John Popham, uh, rest, may he rest in peace, um, wanted to show people devices and technologies and stuff that could, would help them uh, communicate better, um, as he had tried to do throughout, throughout his life. Um, and we've had some success with that, and we continue to try and bring people devices and in, information that might, might help them. Um, so the next uh, item I picked up was a, a digital inclusion knowledge fair, which I wasn't aware of and sounds really fascinating. Unfortunately, the um, the uh, time for submitting, uh, making submissions to it has, has passed, but I still think it's worth noting it's happening on the 9th of July. Um, and this is from the um, uh, in, in, uh, International Labour Organization. Um, and they, they say that digital inclusion isn't about hardware or software, it's about mindware. Um, in this age of accelerated digital transformation, we must act together to bridge the digital divide and ensure no one's left behind. So this is an encore to their Digital Inclusion Summit, which is happening earlier in uh, in July, I think the a few days, 7th and 8th before the, the 9th when this event is on. They want to seize the opportunity to learn from digital inclusion practitioners worldwide, showcase work in promoting more inclusive digital learning experiences, and discover the potential of digital solutions for lifelong learning and employability. So it sounds like something that would be um, of interest, you know, to people, we, uh, our guests and to um, people who listen to the show. Um, yeah, that says there on, on screen, Swain has it now, it says submit the proposal by 18th of June. So we've missed that, but I think it's, it still would be very interesting. Um, it's going to be very interesting, you know, international event. Um, and I'm hoping to pick up some um, stuff from that myself. I like the, I like the quote there on screen from uh, Lucia Adams. Digital is 10% tech and 90% human. I think we certainly um, agree with that because it is all about the you know the contacts you make with people, the connections we have with people. Yeah, I think it's um, I think the uh, previous point that you were making also is relevant in terms of as soon as you take something digital, it changes the constitution of the group, right? So I do think that moving into this digital inclusion is a thing in and of itself, but I think it also provides an opportunity to revisit inclusion in general, right? Absolutely. Mm. Um, Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. We, we we did we nearly we nearly invented a saying a while ago when one of the one of the fashionable topics was um, data poverty and we, we more or less decided 
because numerous people kept saying similar things to what you've just said there. I mean, you know, data poverty to solve that, it's kind of, you take one step back and it's just another factor of poverty poverty. It's not something really weird. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and we had a guest, was we had a guest or I was talking to somebody? Oh yeah, we were, I was talking to somebody who is to going, to do, going to do an MBA in, um, we might have her as a guest in the future actually, an MBA on um, furniture and the pandemic and stuff like that, uh, uh, household furniture. And she's including a device as part of household furniture now. It's, it should be standard that someone yeah. has, you know, a connectivity device. So I'm looking forward to yeah, speaking to her more about that perhaps later in the year. It's lovely to see things like that gradually happen, happening. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, I well, mean, I do remember sorry. that uh, several, several years ago, we used to um, make a joke that Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs should be reformatted to put Wi-Fi underneath security. Uh, but slowly, slowly, the joke is becoming less funny. And I think it, it is, yes. Yeah, it's it's funny because it's not funny, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't oh, yeah. disagree with you there. Okay, we'll cover uh, one more, one or two more stories. One, this one anyway. This is um, an event on the 8th of July called Digital Skills to Connect. And this is Citizens Online, who we've mentioned before on the program, um, are launching their research with the Center for Aging Better, who we've also mentioned, into digital exclusion and digital support for older adults during the pandemic. And they're going to be in conversation with Age UK and Ageless Thanet. Um, so they're asking questions like, are there older adults who have missed out during this period? What types of organizations have supported people with digital skills training needs and how have they adapted their delivery? And what examples of good practice can be shared more widely? And um, from this, um, from this, some of the questions I, I have are, are similar to this and about what are the interesting ways people are being taught to acquire digital skills. There are some very kind of programs that are around there a long time, but if people aren't being um, kind of stimulated in their mind about, you know, what, what they can get from digital, it can be very, it can feel like a hard slog. You know, we, we think um, on being online and communicating using digital tools are, is liberating but not everybody feels like that and we need to you know get across that kind of barrier because it, you know i was speaking to somebody uh, at my new at my new job last week and saying digital is about having bigger better lives it's not about learning how to use a computer it's what that can do you know to bring into your into your sphere it's, it's, and it's change back to, i'm back to suggesting that in order to learn learn r find a real problem to work on yeah absolutely it's, it's, yeah it's motivation it's it's yeah yeah. It's not making a big deal out of something that is part of just one tool among many to, to address life. Yeah. Yeah. That being said, I mean, it does, it does present some, some interesting challenges, right? Just, just last week we were speaking with somebody um, and they brought something to my attention that I never thought of. Um, they said, I find online meetings stressful because I don't know what face I should be putting on. I don't know what my face is doing. And it's not something that I think of when I'm speaking to a human being, but when I'm looking at my face right now, sh yeah. sh should I be smiling more? Or I... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. They find that so distracting yeah. that it actually affects, they lose their concentration. Sure. They're unable to focus and you're a highly yeah. intelligent person. I think it's really easy to forget all these things. When you're using something at a certain level, it's very easy to forget how, how much pain and experience you've come through in using it how much time it's taken to become familiar with that i think that particular problem is a problem of familiarization i think it's a problem of getting used to it um it used to be very unusual to be to hear your voice recorded ever mm. and people used to be shocked and terrified and dis disgusted when they heard their own voice for the first time nobody's like that anymore no. not at all no. I, I don't like my voice <laughs> I do not like my voice. But it's, that's not the point. The point is you you know what it is and you've dealt with it. You yeah. know how you yeah. know yeah. it's not a big thing anymore. I think there's quite a lot of familiarization and experience stuff still to go with Zoom and, and online meetings. I do like the fact that on Zoom you can hide your, your own face um in the settings <laughs> if you want can to. You really? I think yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you look on the on the video settings, uh, one of the ones is to be able to hide yourself, self view or something it's called. Yes, so, for for, for yeah. listeners to Hope Radio, we are now all staring intently at our <laughs> at our video <laughs> settings. <laughs> yeah. Um, turn off my video when joining meeting. Oh, uh, what is it? Um, I can't see it right now. Can you see it, Swain? Virtual. I do know, but there is definitely the a setting. There is one, it. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I can't see, I can't find it just immediately. Yeah. Anyway, but you we can't. Leave. You can. yeah. so. We're probably <laughs> coming towards the end, are we? 
Yes, we are. I think we're, we're, run, out, we're run out of time. Um, we're very really delighted you were able to join us today. We think we, the conversation was really good and we hope that our listeners and, and watchers will um, find something of interest there. I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we expect that people will come back to the YouTube channel and, and look and kind of pick up links and on Hope Radio in South Birmingham. Um, we, we know we have um, several hundred listeners and uh, they, will, they will certainly find something of what you said interesting. Um, so I want to let people know where to find you online. If I go back to your... Um, your bio, I'll just find it there. Yeah, so you um, blog at uh, uh, www.amitkohli, A-M-I-T-K-O-H-L-I.com and um, www.asdivoka, as, as how do you spell it? How do you pronounce Act, it? Activoka. Activoka, I beg your pardon, yeah. .org, um, slash news, slash by author, slash Amit Kohli. So um, I'm sure people can find you there. Are you on Twitter? Do you do you publicize your Twitter? Yeah, I am on Twitter. Um, Viz Monkey as in a visualization monkey with a Z. Okay. Um, or email also works. Uh, my uh, professional email is data at amitkohli.com. So that's Great. A-M-I-T-K-O-H-L-I. Great. Thanks again for joining us. And um Thanks to our listeners, and we wish everyone has a great day, a great week. Have a great week, everybody. Bye. Thank you very much.